Thanks for downloading this episode of the Resilient Advisor Podcast. My name is Jay Coulter, and joining me today is Mark Yusko, who is the founder, CEO, and chief investment officer of Morgan Creek Capital. Today, we're going to talk about a topic that I'm just starting to get into, like most financial advisors, and that's blockchain. Mark, in the Morgan Creek first quarter market review and outlook, which, by the way, I'm going to include links to that in the show notes. I recommend everybody subscribe to it. You stated that the blockchain technology will, quote, create a wave of wealth creation, the likes of which the world has never seen. And Mark, that's a huge statement, but you're also putting your money where your mouth is, as your firm now allocates almost half of its resources to the space. So my first question is this, what are financial advisors and investors like myself missing who are not paying attention? Uh, Jay, it's a great, great opening question. A couple of things. One, I love the name of the podcast. You know, I have this thing on, on Twitter uh, about hashtag edge. And, and one of my favorite things is that resilience is edge. And uh, so I think it is it's fantastic to, to have a focus of a podcast on that, that trait for advisors. You know, the thing about blockchain, look, I am prone to hyperbole, um, so I do, I do say things sometimes to, uh, to initiate interest and, and get people talking, but I do actually believe, and I, and, I'll, and I think I can back it up, why I do believe this, this technology, and it is technology. Blockchain is technology, and I think that's the biggest thing that people are missing. People think about blockchain as something, cryptocurrency as something. They think of Bitcoin or, you know, and it's, it's something that's linked to anarchists and libertarians and, and things that they don't necessarily agree with. And, you know, they've seen the picture of Satoshi-san with, with his mask, you know, like all the evil masks that the guys, <laughs> the bad guys in the movies wear. And I even put a picture of it in my letter. So I think part of it is what people have to understand is blockchain technology, distributed ledger technology is not new. It's been around for multiple decades. It's been developing. It's been moving to the point, like any technology, where it becomes very useful. And the way S curves work, right? The way adoption of technology works, and that's the the picture at the far right hand side of the top of my letter, is they start off slowly, and then suddenly they pick up momentum. Then they go vertical, parabolic. And that's when the, the mass adoption happens. So if we think about distributed ledger technology, very simple concept. It's basically taking uh, a ledger. So a, you, know, you and I want to play Monopoly. And we, we invite two friends. And instead of you know, picking a banker and the banker hands out money, the problem is the banker can do two things. One, they can make a mistake. right? They could hand you extra 500, which would be good for you and bad for everybody else. Or they could cheat. Right. Every time they pass out a 500 to everybody, they add they give themselves an extra mm -hmm. with distributed ledger technology. You and I and our two friends, we write down that we each have a thousand tokens. All right. Now I land on your hotel. I owe you 100 tokens. So I change my ledger from a thousand nine hundred and your ledger from or your entry in the ledger from a thousand to eleven hundred. The other two guys and you and I look at it and say, yep, that's square. And now we've formed consensus, we've determined that the ledger is sound, and we've created a block, a transaction. That's all it is, right? Now, when you take that and you apply it to this idea of, of cryptocurrency or Bitcoin, for example, is, is the king crypto, basically all we're saying is we're going to take money or value and we're going to digitize it the same way that we digitized information in the internet revolution. And let me pause there and see if I give if I'm going to keep going on that. No, I, that was a great analogy using Monopoly. And maybe we could stick with that analogy as we go through defining some terms to make it clear yeah. how this works. So when somebody hears the term Bitcoin, is there that's the currency in the space or are there multiple types of currency? So there are definitely multiple cryptocurrencies, and it's very important to differentiate between cryptocurrencies, which are blockchain technology applications that are used either as a store of value, 
like like digital gold, for example, and that, that's kind of what Bitcoin is today. Think of Bitcoin as digital gold. It really isn't technologically advanced enough today to be a global currency, which is what I think it will end up five, eight, ten years from now. Uh, but today, think of it as digital gold. It's just a great way to store value. Second thing you have to think about is, is these things called ICOs. So ICOs, initial coin offerings, uh, people confuse them and conflate the terms. And they say, oh, there, you know, there's unlimited cryptocurrencies. You know, there's 1,700 of these things. No, there's about eight or 10 cryptocurrencies. There's about 1,700 ICOs. What an ICO is, it's a utility token. Okay, it's a token that represents either access to a network, uh, a point system like airline miles, or a way of, of uh, compensating people for participating in a network. So a utility token is basically just uh, crowdsourced venture capital, crowdsourced early stage venture capital. Some of these things are going to be 10 baggers, 20 baggers, 100 baggers, but most of them, probably 90 plus percent, are going to go to zero, just like most startups, right? We all hear about Apple starting in, in a garage, but we don't hear about the nine other companies that started in a garage and failed. The last thing we need to separate is security tokens. So, you know, the SEC two days ago was a really big day in the world of, of blockchain technology, et cetera, because the SEC ruled finally that cryptocurrencies were not securities, which they're not, they're currencies or commodities. And that was good. And I actually, I applaud the SEC. They have handled this whole thing incredibly well. They've been very measured, very thoughtful. And, you know, I really hope someone from the SEC hears that because they don't get applauded very often. That's right. Uh, second thing I think they uh, did is they said that ICOs, hmm, a whole bunch of them actually are securities. And the difference, what makes something a security is let's say Mark and Jay start MJ Coin. And we sell tokens and MJ coin is going to be a way for people to give us, you know, a token if they appreciated the podcast. OK, that would be a utility token. Okay? Now, if MJ token said, oh, no, what we're going to do is we're going to sell 20 percent of the equity in Mark and Jay Inc. That's a that's a security. And if you issue that as MJ token and you're issuing equity in a business, you violated securities laws, and and those people should get prosecuted. So, um, I think the SEC will be measured in, in going after the real bad actors there, and I think that's good. But security tokens. Hey, Mark, can, this can is the big for, opportunity. Mark, can I stop you for a second before oh, yeah. we move on for yeah. ICOs? All right. Yeah. So, to be in its most basic form, you and I can start an ICO and go out and raise a hundred million dollars and go buy apartment complexes, or I mean, anything we want. Invest in private equity, invest in, it's limitless. Is that limitless. correct? I mean, absolutely limitless. Okay. I mean, a, a token can't, well, a couple things that are important. So, so if you and I want to do real estate, um, most likely people aren't going to give you and I money for you and I to go buy real estate for us, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to give you and I real estate money to go buy real estate so that they can share in that real estate. That would be a security token. Okay, that would be a real asset. We're going to take real estate. We're going to convert fiat currency into cryptocurrency or tokens. And essentially, this is this is the future, right? This is the digital security uh, of the future. And if you think about our business, right? All of us advisors and wealth managers and consultants and, and people that help people manage capital. We live in a world and we operate in a world that's been the same for 400 years, which is crazy, right? We still transact business using paper, analog securities, right? Mm -hmm. And people say, oh, no, no, we're in the electronic age and there are these digital things. They're, they're Q-SIPs. Like, no, they're not digital. They're electronic. You know, a Q-SIP is just an alphanumeric code that represents a physical security, a bond or a stock certificate or a real estate title, or a car title, or whatever. So ownership still goes back to paper. Well, paper is very inefficient, and there's auditors that have to be paid, and there's custodians that have to be paid, and there's all these middlemen and all this bloat. I mean, think about it. If I want to sell you a stock, why does it take three days or two days to settle? 
that's ridiculous. It takes mm-hmm. two days to settle because there are like seven different databases that have to be checked and updated and audited. And the piece of paper has to go from one place and one account to another account at DTC. And all this stuff has to happen. If I want to give you something of value, Jay, I should just be able to do it directly on the blockchain. Okay, The nodes in the chain confirm that that transaction is good or valid. And then it's immutable, secure, and permanent. And we don't need any middlemen. We don't need any bank to tell us that I transferred value to you. We don't need any third party to audit it because it's on the chain. It's publicly available in information. So if we were going to raise money to do private equity or real estate, that's a security token offering. These are going to be huge. This is where I'm going to spend most of chapter three of my life. You know, I spent chapter one working for not-for-profits, chapter two building the first part of Morgan Creek, and now chapter three is going to be all about tokenizing the world and, and helping people move from the analog age to the digital age. And the digital age is that every item of value, I believe every item of value in the world, okay, real estate, private equity, businesses, stocks, bonds, anything of value will no longer be represented by a paper security, but a digital security, digital ownership. And that will strip out inefficiency, it'll strip out cost, but most importantly, it increases the viability and the the applicability of a global marketplace. Just think about this, the Plaza Hotel, iconic hotel in New York, how many buyers are there of the Plaza Hotel? 500? thousand some number some small number why because it's got a big ticket it's illiquid it takes lots of lawyers and lots of transaction costs and it's pretty you know tough to transact to buy the plaza hotel imagine if we tokenized the equity of that hotel and we fractionalized the ownership that would trade 24 7 globally how many people in the world would want to own a piece of the iconic Plaza Hotel. I'm going to guess more than a thousand. Mm -hmm. And what that'll do is it'll raise the value of illiquid assets. The illiquidity premium will vanish. And the people who take advantage of it in the short run are going to make lots and lots of money. So it's, and the other thing is we're just at the very beginning of this. You know, people want to say, oh, you know, this is the bubble and the crash and it's over and everything's going. No, 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 no. We're in 1993, and the reason I say that is technology moves in waves, and it works, moves on a 14-year cycle. Why it's 14 years, I don't really know, but it's a 14-year cycle. It has to do with computing power. 1954, we had the mainframe. 1968, we had the microchip. 1982, we had the personal computer. 1996, we had the internet. 2010, we had the mobile net, or everyone had an iPhone. And today, in 2024... Okay, that's that's six years from now. So we're like in 1993, 94, like in the internet. So the internet bubble happened in 2000. The age of blockchain technology or the internet of value bubble will occur in 2024. So then think about the great wealth that was created because of the internet. It wasn't pre-2000. It was post-crash. It was from 2002 to today. Companies like Facebook and, you know, Amazon, all these things have become huge. Apple, you know, what may be the first trillion dollar company. Those all happen post the collapse of the bubble because that's what happens is the disruption happens. The early adopters prove the concept and then the mass adoption comes in and builds huge businesses. So that's back to the first comment. I think the first multi-trillion dollar businesses will emerge over the next decade as a result of blockchain technology. So in that report, you talk about $700 trillion in assets that will need to be tokenized eventually. What kind of looking for, what does that look like? Is my car tokenized? Is my house tokenized? Or is this just a purely business application at the commercial level? Well, in terms of, in terms of the 700 trillion, what's the, what's the opportunity set? Not just the opportunity set, but what does that look like in 2024, in 2030, if everything is tokenized? Is yeah. the value of so, my car uh, tokenized? Is the house tokenized? Yeah, so I, I, I believe the answer is yes. 
I, I said, I believe, and I don't, I don't know how long it's going to take exactly. Let, let's call it a decade. Um, and over that period, what's going to happen is I think the trophy assets will get tokenized first because, you know, people want to own a piece of them. So my guess is that a sports franchise will tokenize and will sell themselves to the fans. How many fans would like to own a little piece of their team? I think a lot. A lot. I think a lot, right? I think um, big, iconic real estate properties will tokenize. I think uh, large businesses owned by families with multi-generational uh, challenges will be tokenized. And if you think about it, over time, what's going to happen is this digital world will emerge. We'll have digital exchanges. And, you know, a number of them are being created. There's a big announcement by Coinbase the other day. And and a number of these are, are popping up. Fidelity is, you know, supposedly doing something, you know, behind the scenes. You know, what do they know about investing? You know, so <laughs> It's it's interesting that um, there's all these people that that don't want this to succeed, right? You know, and and Warren Buffett calls it you know worse than rat poison squared, which I'm not even sure what that means. And uh, Charlie Munger even one upped Warren and said it's like trading you know harvested baby brains. I'm like, really, <laughs> really? What what does that even mean? <laughs> and Jamie Dimon calls it a fraud. And, and you know the funny thing about that was the next day. JP Morgan was actually the largest buyer of Bitcoin on the planet. So a little disingenuous to call it a fraud and then have, you know, other people in the firm buying it the next day. Talking the market so, down a little bit. Yeah, the market was down a little bit. Surprise, surprise. So look, why do those guys want to spread what I call FUD? Fear, well, I don't call it, somebody else made it up. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. It's because they have a lot to lose. If we don't need a trust institution to tokenize an asset, you know, you and I we own MJ Inc. and we want to tokenize our business and we want to file the proper you know, papers to create a security token or a digital security, that's great. And MJ Inc. can go out and raise capital in a global marketplace. We don't need an investment bank. We don't need a bank. We don't, you know, we're going to have our own blockchain technology oriented business. We're going to have our own security token, our own digital security. And over time, what this does is it disrupts the banking industry, it disrupts the auditing industry, it disrupts the custody uh, uh, industry. So there are a lot of people that don't want this to happen. It reminds me very much, and most people don't know why, down in New Amsterdam, part of New York, uh, the stoops on homes are nine feet high. And I always ask people, do you know why that is? And everybody looks at me like, I have no idea. Well, it's because horse shit used to, pardon my French, although I, I, I said that once, in, with a Frenchman, he said, "Why do you say that? We're not vulgar." Um, so I don't didn't mean to swear on the, but um, and I don't know why we say "pardon my French." So maybe someone can enlighten me. But what I think is interesting is is hor horse poop used to stack up five six feet tall. So what happened when the horseless carriage came along? What did the street sweepers do? They said, "Oh, they're dangerous. You wouldn't want to ride in one of those. You could die. It's terrible. It's like harvesting, you know, baby brains." And they didn't want you to use that new invention, that new technology, because they were going to lose their job. And the fact is, those jobs are gone. They're not coming back. But guess what? We created huge new businesses and huge new opportunities. And everybody's worried about all the jobs that this technology is going to get rid of. But it's going to create many more jobs. Think of all the people that work for Amazon today, all the people that work for Facebook today. Those companies didn't really exist 20 years ago. So I think we tend to be so rooted in our today that we forget that what separates great investors from average investors is average investors always focus on the last play. The great investors always focus on the next play, right? Yep. Wisdom from Coach K. Yep. I like it. So Man, I have so many follow-up questions to that, but I want to keep this short because we like to keep our podcast under 30 minutes. So our audience are financial advisors. You talked about disruption with custodians. What other vendors will find disruption to financial advisors? And then how will financial advisors themselves see some disruption as a result of this? Yeah, look, you know, the financial 
advisor industry is, is under assault, right? I mean, I just saw the copy of my Real Asset Advisor magazine today with, you know, the, the head of Betterment there with his iRobot label. And, you know, the robot, the robo-advisor are coming and, and AI is coming for us and then we're going to replace all the humans and nobody's going to use humans anymore. And I don't buy it. You know, I think that, that the human touch and service and, and uh, client service and, and relationships I think is really important. Uh, I do think that there are things that computers can do and, and AI, true AI, which really there's not very much of today, uh, can do that can be helpful. Ultimately, blockchain really doesn't assault the, the financial services industry itself. Uh, what it does, I think it facilitates um, creating a new asset class. You know, cryptocurrency is a new asset class. It's a great diversifier for portfolios. It's one of the few assets I've ever seen in my career, and I've actually been around a reasonable amount of time, that actually lives up to the promise of having low correlation with other assets. Um, you know, most alternatives, particularly liquid alternatives, have not done a very good job being uncorrelated to stocks, bonds, and cash. And whereas, you know, crypto actually is and does. So I think there's lots of opportunities for advisors to think about how to integrate into the portfolio. And, you know, for most advisors, they work for firms where the firms have said, nope, you can't do crypto yet. It's coming, you know, and we're going to hopefully help help do that through an index fund vehicle. Uh, and, you know, Mark Novogratz is out trying to do the same thing. Mike Novogratz, not Mark. I'm Mark. He's Mike. Um, Novo is out trying to do the same thing. And, Someone's going to get there. I think ultimately there'll probably be an ETF, although there are reasons why the SEC doesn't want to do that yet. Um, but in the short run, you know, I would steer clear of the ETFs that claim to be blockchain focused because they're basically just S&P 500 index funds. Um, they're not very interesting. Uh, there are some blockchain related companies, you know, but stay away from the ones that change their name to blockchain you know, because they don't really do blockchain like Long Island Ice Tea and, and Riot and things like that. But there are companies, you know, that are doing some interesting things. Overstock and what they're doing at T0 is really interesting. It's volatile, but it's a good long-term interesting bet. So there are companies out there related to blockchain that you can buy. The real way to play it, at least in the short run, is to own the companies that that make it easier for cryptocurrency and blockchain technology to to uh, evolve, which are things like NVIDIA and AMD. Now, NVIDIA is pretty expensive. AMD is cheaper, you know, so maybe there's a pair trade in there. Um, but, you know, companies like IBM are trying to reinvent themselves. And, you know, the Taiwan semiconductor manufacturers are increasing the, the game in terms of putting out new chips to compete with the Bitmain ASICs ant miners. So uh, maybe the Thai semiconductor uh, companies are interesting. So there are lots of ways to play and then the final thing is just own some crypto. So find a way to own it, you know, put wallets together, experiment with it, put a little bit in. You don't have to put a lot, right? I mean, a 1% investment in cryptocurrency today, multiples in a world where bonds are giving us 3% and stocks maybe at best or 3 to 5% over the next decade, might even be less. I don't know. Sounds like a pretty good diversifier. So and then the last thing I'll say is there's something called GBTC, which is a uh, Cayman listed trust. It's not perfect because it trades at a big premium like a closed end fund, but it does track uh, Bitcoin and is one way to get a little exposure and to try it out and to, to see how it works as a diversifier and as, as an education thing. So that's a lot. And I apologize for squeezing too much in a short amount of time. Maybe we can do a follow up at another time. First of all, I appreciate you sharing ways that the advisors could look to allocate to the space. I think what I'm taking away from what you're saying is today it might be best to go and look for, if you go back to the gold rush days, go look for the people selling the picks and the axes at this stage yep. in the process. Yeah, is that be, fair? Be, oh, yeah. Be the guy. This is a true story. Be the guy who bought every shovel in San Francisco and ran down the California Avenue yelling, there's gold in them Mar Hills. <laughs> Awesome. Well, Mark, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. This has been incredibly informative, and I've got a hunch that we look back on this episode three years from now and we'll be just blown away at how much this sector has grown. Oh, I agree, and I look forward to doing it again sometime, and thanks for having me.